piece that Prue just played came from a Easter cantata called Celebrate Life, and that particular song was when Jesus was doing what we call the Last Supper. And uh, it's a beautiful song, and it brings back many memories. There was this pastor that each time that he would stand in the pulpit, he would take off his watch and place it on the pulpit. And there was a visitor who leaned over to one of the deacons and said, well, what does that mean? And the deacon responded, nothing, absolutely nothing. And the only reason I did that was because the clock behind where I can see it is broken. So I can ignore it, and I can ignore this one. So I just want to let you know that this means nothing, absolutely nothing. I don't intend for this to be a long sermon, but it probably will because of the volume of text that's required to get through it. As we said, we've been going through the life and ministry of Jesus, the Messiah, and we're trying to do it in a somewhat uh, chronological way. It's, it's imperfect, um, but the context is that Jesus had just fed over 5,000 men and, cl- and then plus women and children, and he sent his disciples on ahead on, in a boat across the sea, and he dispersed the crowd. And then he walked across the water. His disciples became frightened. I'm sure Jesus was a bit disappointed because they'd seen him change water into wine. They'd seen him preach about the kingdom of God. They saw him heal the sick and the disease to cure those who had various types of uncleanliness, that he healed those who were demon-possessed. He even raised the dead. So walking on water wouldn't be all that big a deal to Jesus because he has authority over the natural world. And his feeding of those thousands, I think Jesus was hoping that it would click who he is. But they're like us, a little dense. But Peter did at least walk on water for a period of time until he placed his focus on the waves and not on Jesus. And so this is following up on those two events. And in John 6, starting with verse 22, it says this, the next day the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. And there came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into small boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? So, they noticed there was no way for Jesus to get there and the time that it took Jesus to get there, because he didn't go with the disciples, he wasn't with them, and so but they are seeking Jesus. And ordinarily, you would say that's a good thing for people to seek Jesus. But their motives aren't quite pure. Verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. So Jesus puts the right on. He goes, I know, I know why you're seeking me. You're not seeking me because I perform signs showing that I am the Messiah, the chosen one of God. You come because you got your bellies filled without costing you anything, and you're hoping that I'll do it again. 
that you're looking for temporal things, for things that make your life easy, and that's why you seek Jesus. And let's face it, there are a number of people who do, in fact, seek Jesus, but they seek Jesus for their own rewards and for their own needs. Verse 27, do not do the work for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father, God, has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, what shall we do so that we may do the work, the works of God? So they at least answer the, the question, what is it that we're supposed to do to do the works of God? Now, again, that's a question that many people will ask. Well, what is it that I need to do to earn heaven? What do I need to do to impress God? What is it I need to do to please God? And most of us expect the answer of, well, be a good little boy and girl. Go to church. Don't do all these certain naughty things that you shouldn't do. Um, be kind to other people. Uh, and if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, everything will be okay. That's what they're expecting Jesus kind of to say. But Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Listen, you want to know about works of God? The works of God is to believe. As the writer of Hebrews says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So, you want to know how to work your way into heaven? Believe in Jesus. Their response is interesting. So, they said to him, What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? Well, notice Jesus had just rebuked them, saying, You didn't come here to see signs. You came here for me to give you bread. But I perform signs. I've healed. I have opened the eyes of the blind. I have opened the ears of the deaf. I have healed the lame. They have leaped for joy. I have done all these things to show you, and I have preached to you the kingdom of God and done it with authority. I've already performed for you signs. But you didn't come here looking for signs, and now you're asking me for signs. Because it's always, well, what if? Well, what if? And we find that the person who claims to seek for God is always looking for an excuse. What works do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus says, okay, you're quoting an Old Testament passage about how when Moses was leading the children of God, that he daily fed them manna, except on Friday when they got a double portion so that they wouldn't work on the Sabbath. And he's saying, you're placing the wrong emphasis on praise. It's not Moses that gave you manna. It was God. And just as God gave your father's manna, God is now giving you the true bread of life. And their response is, Lord, always give us this bread. It kind of, that response is almost identical to the Samaritan woman at the well when Jesus talks about giving a, asking for a drink. And he says, if you knew the water that I have, that you would never thirst. And she goes, Lord, give that water to me always. The sad thing in this instance is in the Samaritan's woman's case, she ultimately ended up believing in Jesus. These people are still hard-hearted. So they said, Lord, always give us this bread. We've already told them how to get the bread, to believe. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Now this in John's gospel is the beginning of the first I am. And we read it 
And when, because it kind of makes sense, well, I am bread and whatever. But when Jesus says, I am, he's saying something very specific. He's going back to the very same Old Testament passages. And when Moses says, well, who is it that I'm to say that sent me? He says, I am sent you. Jesus, I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am. And Jesus will go through in various times that we will see in his ministry, reemphasizing that he is I am. I am the bread of life. Who comes, he who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. He's Jesus saying, the fathers ate manna. They understood that. They ate it. Here I am. I am the bread of life. I've come down out of heaven. You see me, and you still refuse to believe. And then he says this, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that, I, that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. People are always saying, well, what's the will of God? The will of God is to believe in Jesus. That's his will. Without doing that, the rest of it doesn't matter. You can, part of the will of God is for us to pray for one another. But if you don't start with the belief of Christ, praying doesn't get you anything. The will of God is for us to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he raises up on the last day. We have that faith that we will never die. We will have eternal life. And even if we die, he raises us up. The also, the important thing here is that there, Jesus is saying there is security for the believer. Jesus says, I lose none of those who come to me. I find it interesting that people in their theology struggle with the eternal security of the believer. Jesus speaks it. The scriptures throughout speak it, that nothing can separate you from the love of God. It is God who holds on to you. Yes, you try to hold on to him, but he never lets you go. And Jesus says, the will of God is that I don't lose one single person. But I only hold on to those who God has delivered to me. Therefore, the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came out out of heaven. See, they're catching on. They're understanding he's come down from heaven, which means he's claiming not only that he's the Son of God, but that he is God. And how dare he do that? And they were saying, is not this Jesus? Now, I want you to notice something. The son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. You will hear a lot of people say, Joseph has never talked about, so he must have died sometime during the time Jesus was before his ministry. I'm telling you, that's an assumption you can't make. Because they could have said, here, if Joseph died, he, Joseph was his father. We knew Joseph before he died. He says, but Joseph's father and mother we know, not we knew. The reason the scriptures don't talk about Joseph, because he's irrelevant. It's to believe in the son. Joseph's job was to make sure that the child was safe. And then his job was done off the stage. Now, I'm not saying he didn't die at some point, but you can't always assume things. 
And Jesus answered them and said, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I'm going to leave it there, but notice what Jesus said. Only people come to Jesus who God draws. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. You see, the Scriptures prepare their hearts for belief. And that's what Jesus is saying. When they have been taught by the Father, they are drawn to him. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has even seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. He doesn't say maybe an extra bonus. Belief in the Son equals eternal life. And as I say and will say again, it is not life, death, life. It is life, 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 life. To be absent from the body is to be present with God. There's not a pause. There's not a timeout. It's just a vacation from the body waiting for the new one. And then he reinforces it. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. Notice because their faith was not in God, but in the manna. As long as the manna was there, they were fine, except when the manna got boring and then they wanted something else. But Jesus says the bread is all sufficient. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that the one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Bold statements. And then he says this. Then, then the Jews say, then the Jews began to argue with one another. I always love it. If you notice, Jesus will say something pretty astonishing. Instead of people saying, well, what do you mean, Jesus? Or I don't understand Jesus. Or how can this be, Jesus? Notice what they do. Then the Jews began to argue with one another. It's like a pastor giving a sermon, then you go home and argue about what he had to say. Ask him. So they're arguing amongst themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Which would be a reasonable question if they would ask Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died, he who eats this bread will live for. Not only does Jesus not back down from what he just said, he doubles down. He goes, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood or you have no eternal life. Verse 39, 59. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. 
He's teaching this all over and including the synagogue. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult or a hard statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to, the fa- to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. As a result, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. You see, Jesus still tried to teach them, but he did not back down. All too often, the church is so interested in filling the pews that we water down the gospel, hoping that they'll accept it and stay. That's not Jesus' way. Jesus gives you the truth, and even if it slaps you in the face, he presents it and says, that's what it is. Now, in case you're worried, Jesus is not talking about cannibalism. He explains it here before the disciples walk away. And yet, in the first century, Christians were accused of being cannibals because they heard about what we're going to participate in a little about, about how the the disciples would eat flesh and drink blood. And they kind of thought, well, they went out and stole babies and would eat flesh and drink blood. And and we were accused of being cannibals. Jesus is saying, I'm talking about spirit and life. Not talking about the physical, I'm talking about the spiritual. I'm telling you, if you do not accept my broken body and my sacrifice for you to create faith in you, to then sustain you in that faith and to grow you in that faith and to mature you in that faith, just as food allows you to grow and mature and have your body work as it ought to work because it receives the calories and the nutrition that it needs Jesus is saying, my sacrifice is what causes your faith to grow, to sustain you, and to keep you moving. It's spirit and it's life. But a lot of his disciples left. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? You see, we have this idea that when Jesus was ministering, just 12 guys showed up and followed him around. No, Jesus was becoming the thing to do. And people were following him because, after all, he was feeding them. He was doing some kind of neat miracles. And, they, and he taught these things, and they thought it was cool until he said these hard statements. So they walked away, but the 12 were still there. And Simon and Peter answered him, Lord, To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, Peter says, I don't understand all that you're saying. I don't understand all that you're doing. I try, I get out of the boat, I do, and I fail, and I do all these things. And I, and I really try to follow what you're teaching. And even though I don't understand it sometimes, and even though I don't get it, I know they're words of life. So where else do I go? If I don't continue to follow in you. And that should be the response of all of us. Oh, sure, when Jesus teaches, we're to love our enemies. Really, Jesus, that's a hard thing to say. I just don't like my enemy. I'd rather see them ground in the dust. But because you say it, I will do it. Because you have the words of life. Do 
We had a group of people who followed Jesus because he fed them. We have a group of people who followed him until what he had to say was just too hard for them to take. And then there was a group of people who said, where else do we go? So I guess the question I have for each of us, which one of those three people are we? Are you hanging around God so that he might perform some miracle? Are you hanging around God or you go to whatever church you go to because they, as we preachers like to say, tickle your ears, tell you the things that you want to hear, how wonderful you are, how to have a great next Monday? Or is it that you want to hear about the words of life? So Peter says, not only do you have the words of life, that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is of a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So even in this small group, there's still those who portray. But notice, again, Jesus says, I chose you. You think you chose me. You want to take the credit for choosing me, but the reality is I chose you. Now, we kind of have this thing, well, it's not fair. How come I don't get to choose? I praise God he chose me because I wouldn't. And he chose you, and I wouldn't. And he chose a lot of people who are behind pulpits and sitting in pews and sitting at home because they're mad at God or whatever. And he chose a whole lot of people that I wouldn't. So I don't know why we get so upset. I think it's pretty awesome. It's like, I'll use the sports analogy again. Actually, it's kind of like P.E. Or, or playing in your street. A bunch of kids get together, and they're going to play baseball. And usually they pick for captains the two best baseball players because nobody wants the two best baseball players to be on the same team because it's not fair. And so then by somehow somebody flips a coin or does something, and they start choosing and the better a baseball player you are, or if you're a good friend or something, they, they pick you. If you're not a good baseball player, it's not a comfortable feeling because everybody's being picked. And you're still there. And there's even some who say, like, the teams aren't fair. Well, you can have him. It's like, well, gee, thanks. He's no good. He. He can't catch the ball if I hand it to him. And you know how it feels to be. Nobody wants me. Nobody thinks. God doesn't care what kind of baseball player you are. He will make you a golden glove. He will make you a base-stealing master. Because he chooses those who aren't. He doesn't choose the noble, the best. He chooses you and me. That we might not just be on the best baseball team, but that might we have eternal life. So we're going to go back. Jesus states that he is the bread of life, that we must, spiritually eat of this food and drink of his sacrifice. But that we must do the work of God. The work of God is interesting. As I said, they were expecting him to lay out a bunch of do's and don'ts. And we keep waiting and expecting God to do some do's and don'ts. 
And as I've shared before, if Jesus were to say, for those who live in Orange County, to do the work of God is that you take a peanut, go to Golden West, get on the freeway, and push the peanut from Golden West to Fairview. And if you survive the traffic and your nose isn't worn out, you'll enter heaven. Suddenly, there'll be all kinds of traffic people on their hands and knees pushing a peanut down the freeway to get eternal life. But Jesus says, this is too easy. All we're supposed to do is to believe that he's the son of God and he'll give us eternal life? The answer is yes. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So as those who did not believe said, Lord, forever give us this bread. He only needs to give it to us once by our faith in him. In a moment, we are going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's interesting, in the Gospel of John, he never, even though he spends about four chapters during the Last Supper, he never really talks about the Last Supper. But this is the preview for it. This is the prologue that says, this is what it's all about. That my body, which is broken for you, do in remembrance of me. This is my blood, which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we take these, not as cannibals, but as a statement of faith that it is his sacrifice that gave us birth, that sustains us, that keeps us, that justifies us, and will someday glorify us. And that true bread came from heaven, and he will raise us up. And all God's people said,